Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video here on my YouTube channel. Today's setup is a little bit different as you guys can probably tell if you've seen previous videos of me in the past. We're just testing it out. We're seeing how it goes. You guys can let me know in the comments whether or not you like it. I probably should not have worn a black sweatshirt because I'm kind of just looking like a floating head right now, but it's okay. As you guys can tell by the title of today's video, today we are talking about the solved case of eight-year-old Maddie Clifton. This is a whirlwind of a case and it is one that's extremely frustrating and you guys I'm sure will have plenty of opinions on it by the end of it and I cannot wait to hear them. So make sure you leave those in the comments below. And with that being said, let's move on into the video. Now, before we get started with today's video, I do want to thank our sponsors, the first being BetterHelp. Now, if you guys have never heard of BetterHelp before, BetterHelp is something that I've talked to you about a couple times. However, it is an online counseling website that allows you to get professional counseling in the comfort of your own home. Once you sign up with BetterHelp, you will take an online quiz and after that quiz, you will be matched with a professional counselor that is best deemed to fit your needs. BetterHelp has counselors that specialize in a bunch of different areas, including anxiety, depression, grief, LGBTQ plus matters, relationships, sleeping trauma, anger, and more. And if for whatever reason you are unhappy with the counselor you have been matched with, you will be able to request a new counselor at any time for no additional additional charge. With BetterHelp, you can get help at your own time and at your own pace. Once you sign up and are matched with a counselor, you will be able to plan secure video or phone sessions with them, as well as be able to text them at any time you need. BetterHelp is secure, convenient, and professional. And best of all, my listeners will get 10% off their first month using BetterHelp when you go to betterhelp.com slash instinct. Again, that is just betterhelp.com slash instinct. Go to betterhelp.com slash instinct and fill out the simple questionnaire to then get matched with a counselor you will love. Again, that is just betterhelp.com slash instinct. Daily Harvest has been the one thing that makes me feel better about my day and about myself. Personally, I love Daily Harvest's smoothies. In particular, their cold brew and almond one has been my absolute favorite. And if you don't know what Daily Harvest is, Daily Harvest delivers delicious food that's all built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It literally takes minutes to prepare and I never have to think twice about if the food I'm eating is good for me. Daily Harvest never uses any preservatives or added sugars or artificial anything. Daily Harvest is undeniably delicious. It is clean food without any of the prep work. So if you guys want to get started today, you can go to dailyharvest.com and enter the promo code KILLER to get $25 off your first box. That is promo code KILLER for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Again, that is just dailyharvest.com with the promo code KILLER. All right, and the last sponsor we have today is Best Fiends. I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of guilty pleasures. They include ice cream and reality TV shows and things of that nature. But one thing that I never feel any guilt about is how much I love playing Best Fiends. Best Fiends gives me endless entertainment that I can access anytime right on my cell phone. Best Fiends is an impossible to put down puzzle game that you can download directly to your phone. I have actually gotten a lot of my friends hooked onto Best Fiends as well. I've gotten my brother and my sisters to play it too, and we all love it because it is the perfect balance of entertaining and challenging. I am currently on level 223, and I know that sounds absolutely insane, but the levels go by so fast, and once you start playing, you're not going to want to stop. Best Fiends is constantly adding more levels and challenges to its game, so it is constantly evolving, and it currently has over 100 million million downloads. I've talked to you guys about Best Fiends before and you have sent me the levels that you have gotten on and we've talked about it. So if you guys want to download Best Fiends, you can do so for free by downloading the game at the App Store or on Google Play. Again, that is just Best Fiends, so it's friends without the R. Best Fiends, go play it today. You guys are going to have so much fun and let me know what level you end up getting to. So like I said, today we are talking about the solved case of eight-year-old Maddie Clifton. 
This is a very disturbing case, and one that I do want to mention is very frustrating to research. When I got Maddie's case request in my podcast email and began to do my research, I noticed that all of the information on Maddie's case was more so about her killer instead of her. Immediately when you look up Maddie's name on the internet, a picture of her murderer shows up instead of a picture of her. And along with that, the information about her killer is much more easily accessible than it is when it comes to information about herself. However, nonetheless, today we are here to talk about Maddie, and Maddie was an eight-year-old girl whose life was tragically ended on November 3rd, 1998. Maddie Clifton was born on June 17th, 1990 to her parents, Steve and Sheila Clifton. Growing up, Maddie lived with her parents and older sister, Jessie, in Jacksonville, Florida, more specifically in a neighborhood called Lakewood. Now again, there isn't that much information about Maddie's personality or who she was before this happened to her, which you guys know is something I always like to dive into. I always like to look at who this person was before this tragic thing happened to them because I just think it's super important to look at who they were before this because this does not define who they are as a person. However, because there is none of that out there online, we are going to jump straight to November 3rd, 1998. Now on this afternoon, afternoon, Maddie had actually gone outside to play in her neighborhood. This was something that she did quite often, and her mother told her to be home in time for dinner and before it got too dark outside. Again, this was something that Maddie did quite often, so her parents weren't too worried when she walked out of the door on November 3rd. However, by the time 5 o'clock p.m. rolled around and Maddie still hadn't come home that night, that is when her parents started to get really worried and they actually wasted no time in calling 911 to file a missing persons report for Maddie. By the following day on November 4th, there were so many volunteers who came together from the community to try and find Maddie. I'm talking over a thousand people came together, passing out flyers, trying to find Maddie. They had printed missing persons flyers for Maddie and handed them out to people driving along the street. They pinned them up everywhere they could in the town. And it's actually pretty incredible that in the time span of 24 hours, they were able to get that many volunteers in the community to come together to search for Maddie. The last time anyone had claimed to see Maddie was about 5 o'clock p.m. on November 3rd, and Maddie was not with anyone else. She was playing outside by herself. So there wasn't necessarily anyone that the authorities could talk to who they knew was with her that night. There wasn't anyone who could give any more details about what happened right before she disappeared. And because of this, it definitely led to the imagination being able to create so many different leads. Being able to create so many different potential leads. No one knew what happened to Maddie. They didn't know if she got picked up by a stranger and taken away. They didn't know if it was someone that she knew who ended up luring her out of the neighborhood and ended up kidnapping her. In the beginning of this investigation, the possibilities really were endless as to what could have happened to her that night. Now, when it came to potential leads, the first man that authorities ended up looking into was a man who lived in the same neighborhood as the Cliftons, and about 15 to 20 years prior to Maddie's disappearance, this man had actually been arrested on two separate occasions for sexual assault. However, both of those times that he was arrested, the charges were actually dropped. The authorities did end up giving this man a lie detector test regarding Maddie's disappearance, which he actually ended up failing. He completely failed this lie detector test. However, he did have an alibi that ended up checking out. And this is actually one of the examples of lie detector tests doing more harm than good and not providing the most accurate results. This is exactly why lie detector tests are not viable in a court of law. So once the neighbors were able to check out this neighbor's alibi, he was cleared from having any possible involvement in Maddie's case, regardless of the lie detector test results. Now, when the search for Maddie initially started, there was a $50,000 reward put out for anyone who could provide any information that would lead to Maddie's safe return. And several days after this reward was put out, the reward was actually doubled to $100,000 for anyone who could provide information about Maddie. 
Cincinnati. Along with that, the FBI actually got involved in this case as well. They joined the investigation after a couple days, and Maddie's case was also broadcasted on America's Most Wanted, the TV show. They did an episode to broadcast Maddie's case. So Maddie's case was getting a lot of attention in the media. A lot of people knew about it, not only in Jacksonville, but all throughout the country. However, regardless of the amount of people that were hearing about Maddie's case, no one was coming forward with any information that could help lead to her safe return or could give authorities any information as to who she possibly could have gone off with that day. Now, regardless of how much media attention Maddie's case was getting, it still wasn't leading authorities anywhere closer to figuring out where she was or who she could have gone off with that day. You would think with Maddie's case being broadcasted on so many different platforms, her parents were doing press conferences, the America's Most Wanted TV show covered her case, the FBI was involved. So many different sources were involved in helping trying to find Maddie. However, there was not a single person who came forward to give any information. However, we have seen that in the past. There's a million different outlets that get used in order to help find someone, find a missing person, and no one seems to come forward, which is why a lot of these cases still remained unsolved to this day. Now, the search for Maddie went on for about a week. She disappeared on November 3rd, and the investigation carried on for about a week. And then on November 10th, 1998, everything changed. Now moving on to our next sponsor, which is Daily Harvest. So I don't know about you guys, but this year I am really focusing on what it means to take care of myself. And the process couldn't be any easier with Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest has been the one thing that makes me feel better about my day and about myself. Personally, I love Daily Harvest's smoothies. In particular, their cold brew and almond one has been my absolute favorite. And if you don't know what Daily Harvest is, Daily Harvest delivers delicious food that's all built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It literally takes minutes to prepare and I never have to think twice about if the food I'm eating is good for me. And Daily Harvest is ready when you are. Everything stays fresh in your freezer until you're ready to enjoy it, which ultimately means you're wasting less food too. Daily Harvest never uses any preservatives or added sugars or artificial anything. And they actually just launched their first ever plant-based milk collection starting with almond milk. And this almond milk is only made with almonds and a dash of sea salt. That is literally it. Daily Harvest is undeniably delicious. It is clean food without any of the prep work. So if you guys want to get started today, you can go to dailyharvest.com and enter the promo code KILLER to get $25 off your first box. That is promo code KILLER for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Again, that is just dailyharvest.com with the promo code KILLER. So there was another family that lived in the same neighborhood as the Cliftons, and this family was the Phillips family. This family consisted of the parents, Melissa and Steve Phillips, as well as their son, 14-year-old Josh Phillips. Now, I was unable to figure out if they had any other children besides Josh. However, from what I was able to find, it just seemed like Josh was their only child. Now, let's talk about Josh Phillips for a second. Like I said, Josh at this time in 1998 was 14 years old at the time, and he was born on March 17th, 1984 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Now, growing up, Josh has said that his relationship with his father has been very estranged. Now, growing up, Josh said that his father was an extremely abusive man to be around. Josh claimed that his father, Steve, had an extremely violent and angry temper. He would snap within just a second and lash out on his mother as well as Josh himself. Josh said that he witnessed his dad punch holes into the walls of their home, and he said that it really made him afraid of his dad. It made him scared of what he could possibly do. Seeing how violent he was made him really afraid of his dad overall. Josh also claimed that his dad, Steve, was an alcoholic as well as a drug addict. Basically, Josh just described his father as the worst kind of person you could ever imagine. Now, I also feel like it's important to note that these claims are coming from Josh, and never have I ever seen one person confirm these claims. Josh's mother has never confirmed these claims. No one has come forward and said, yes, this is correct. He does have a violent temper. He is very abusive. Steve and Melissa still stayed together. So I just want to play devil's advocate here for a second and say that this is just coming from Josh, and no 
one else has confirmed this statement. And I wanted to mention that because it does come into play in a minute, which is why it is important to note now Steve's behavior. So on November 10th, 1998, Josh was at school this day and Melissa, Josh's mother, was going throughout the house and cleaning the house. And she walked into Josh's room to begin cleaning it. And when she walked into Josh's room, she said that she started to smell a really strange odor. It smelled absolutely terrible in his room. And she also noticed that Josh, he had a waterbed at the time. So Josh had a waterbed and Melissa noticed that Josh's waterbed was leaking. Melissa thought maybe it was possible that something had popped the waterbed. So she ended up lifting up the waterbed mattress. And when she did that, she discovered the body of eight-year-old Maddie Clifton shoved under Josh's waterbed. Now, when Melissa made this discovery, she was obviously horrified. And the authorities were actually at Maddie's home. It was right across the street from where the Phillips lived. The Cliftons and the Phillips lived right across the street from each other. And so Melissa actually ended up running across the street, grabbing the authorities and leading them to Maddie's body. Now, after the authorities had made the discovery of Maddie's body, they knew that they needed to arrest Josh. So they ended up waiting until he had finished school that day and met him at his school and arrested him right then and there on November 10th. Now, once he was arrested, police were able to now question him. And this is when Josh started to open up about what really happened that night on November 3rd. Now, according to Josh, he said that he was home alone that night. He was sitting in his house when Maddie came over to his home and asked him to come outside and play baseball with him. Josh said he agreed to do this, but he was a little bit skeptical because he wasn't allowed to have friends over while his parents were not home. That was the rule in their house. When Josh was home alone, it just had to be him. He couldn't have any friends over. However, regardless of this rule, he still decided to go outside and play baseball with Maddie. According to Josh, he said he was the one batting while Maddie was pitching him the ball. And right when Maddie pitched him the ball, Josh hit the baseball, which ended up flying back straight into Maddie's face and hitting her in the eye. Now, obviously, a ball moving that fast, once it hits Maddie's eye, she began to start crying crying. She was screaming in pain. Her eye was bleeding. And this is when Josh said he really began to panic. Josh said his panic derived from the fact that he knew his parents were going to be home soon, more specifically his father. And he was terrified of what his father was going to think or say or do to him. In order to stop Maddie from crying, Josh then decided to drag Maddie into his home and into his room. And this is where he began to then strangle her with a phone cord for approximately 15 minutes. After strangling her with the phone cord, Josh then took a baseball bat, the same one that they were playing outside with, and started hitting Maddie over the head with the baseball bat. After hitting Maddie with the baseball bat, he then took Maddie's body and hid it underneath his waterbed. Right when he did this is when Steve ended up coming home, and that is when Josh went into the main room of the house and had a conversation with his dad, acted like everything was completely normal, And then later that night when he returned back into his bedroom, he noticed that Maddie was still making noises, which to him indicated that she was not completely dead. And this is when Josh ended up removing Maddie's body from underneath the bed and began stabbing her. And he stabbed her a total of 11 times. When the authorities asked Josh what his motive was in murdering Maddie, he said that he wanted to get her to stop crying and he was worried about what his dad was going to do if he found out that Maddie was injured, which in hindsight is very ironic. Now, when the autopsy came back, it revealed that Maddie's cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head after being struck multiple times by a blunt object that left her with multiple skull fractures. So the stabbing was not the cause of her death. It was the blunt force trauma to the head. However, she also suffered from stab wounds as well. It was also revealed in the autopsy that there was no evidence of sexual assault. However, Maddie's body was discovered without clothes from the waist down, which Josh said was a result of him dragging Maddie's body into his bedroom. And he said when he did that, that is when her clothes ended up coming off below her waist. 
but there was no evidence of sexual assault. Now, about almost a week after Josh's arrest, on November 16th, the prosecution announced that they were actually going to try Josh as an adult and were pursuing a first-degree murder indictment. However, because he was under the age of 16, Josh was not eligible for the death penalty, which the prosecution said they would have gone for if he was of age. On November 19th, 1998, Josh was relocated from a juvenile detention center to the Duval County Jail where he was held without bail while awaiting his trial. Now, this case, like I said, was huge in the media. And because of that, the judge in this case actually decided to relocate where this trial was going to be held. The trial was originally going to be held in Jacksonville. However, because of the crazy media coverage Maddie's case got, it was really hard to find jurors who were completely indifferent on this case. If you are unaware or have just never been to jury duty before, before, part of the requirement to be a juror that sits on a trial is you have to have no knowledge of the case, of the people involved in the case. You have to have never heard about the case before. You just have to walk in completely indifferent with no possible bias. So for that reason, it was really, really difficult to find people in Jacksonville who were going to have no bias whatsoever in this case. So because of that, this trial ended up being moved from Jacksonville to Polk County. On July 6, 1999, is when the trial for Josh Phillips began, and this was a very, very short trial. It actually only lasted two days. On July 8th, 1999, the trial was completed, and the jury ended up finding Josh Phillips guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I also want to mention that shortly after Josh's case, on June 17th of the year 2000, Josh's father, Steve, was actually involved in a car accident that ended up ending his life. He died in this car accident, and the car accident actually didn't happen far from where Josh was staying in prison. And after Steve's passing, Maddie's mother actually reached out to Melissa, Josh's mother. And it was the first time the two of them had spoke at all since Maddie's body was discovered. Now in December, 2004, Melissa actually tried to seek a new trial for Josh. She stated that the reason that she did this was because Josh was only 14 years old. Old. He was still a young, young child when the murder happened, and she believed that he should not be kept in prison for the rest of his life before it barely even started. So after she made this attempt, this is when new hearing dates were set for Josh in 2005, and then in 2008, the sheriff who arrested Josh, as well as the state attorney, admitted that they were uncertain whether or not the no parole sentencing for a 14-year-old was too harsh. So basically, they were now trying to decide if they believed life in prison without the possibility of parole was too harsh of a sentence for a 14-year-old. Then in 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that sentencing juveniles to life in prison without parole is unconstitutional. So because of the Supreme Court ruling, Josh's attorney took that as a basis to file a resentencing hearing in 2015, and a new sentencing date was actually set for Josh in February 2017. However, once February 2017 rolled around, Josh's attorney asked for more time to prepare his case, which was when the sentencing hearing was pushed back a couple months to June 2017. And then on November 17th, 2017, Josh was resentenced to life in prison. But this is where it kind of gets confusing because even though he was resentenced to life in prison, he has another sentencing date in 2023. So he has a possibility ability to have a lesser sentence once he gets his resentencing in 2023. And what they're basing this resentencing on is whether or not Josh has displayed any growth or maturity throughout his time in prison. He is currently being held at the Cross City Correctional Institute located in Dixie County, Florida. So this is when I turn to you and I ask you the question. Josh was 14 years old when he committed a horrific, horrific act. He completely brutally murdered eight-year-old Maddie Clifton. And because of that, he got life in prison without the possibility of parole. At 14 years old, he walked into jail knowing that he would never walk out. 
for the rest of his life at just 14 years old. So my question to you is, do you think life in prison without the possibility of parole for a 14 year old is too harsh of a sentence? This case reminded me a lot of the James Bulger case. And if you have not checked that out, I did a podcast episode on that case. And James Bulger was completely tortured and brutally murdered. However, his murderers, because they were underage, received almost a royal treatment. They got to change their names so people wouldn't know their identities. They were given government housing and relocating. They got this insane treatment. So it's really interesting to compare their punishment to Josh Phillips's punishment, who was, when he was 14 years old, got life in prison without the possibility of parole. Personally, I don't really know where I lie on this spectrum. Do I think that Josh should be released from prison? No. Do I think that he needs to stay in there longer? Yes. But I'm really, really curious about what you guys think, especially because in two years, he has a possibility to have a lesser sentence. I also think it's important to note that Josh helped in the search for Maddie. He was out there passing out flyers and putting up posters and being involved in the investigation, which to me just adds a whole other level of disturbing to this case. And to me makes me feel like he knew exactly what he was doing, but I'm really, really interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. All right, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. We post weekly here every Thursday and you are not gonna wanna miss it. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.